This video is sponsored by HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com and use code QUALITYCULTURE16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. I don't think any other genre has captured my sense of carefree childhood imagination quite like the adventure film. Born from Lost World pulp fiction that gave rise to Indiana Jones, it's a subcategory of the action blockbuster that seems to have had its hits and misses with each generation ever since. It seems the genre has been steadily replaced with superhero films over the years, even though we do get a couple new ones here and there. But I think it's always been uniquely gratifying to follow the path of the daring explorer, the archaeologist, the swash buckler, the treasure hunter. And although it's not perfect, the 1999 film The Mummy really checks all of the boxes for me for what makes these kinds of stories so enchanting and memorable. You have the charming leads, the pull of the mysterious ancient past, the unnerving elements of horror. It may not even necessarily be unique, but I think it all blends together into a perfect combination for joyous entertainment. Truly chef's kiss. And in this video, I'm gonna use The Mummy as a blueprint to outline the key components of a classic adventure film. The Mummy follows the escapades of Evelyn Carnahan, a librarian and aspiring Egyptologist, and her reluctant guide Rick O'Connell, who's vaguely described in every wiki as simply an adventurer. After saving him from execution, Evie made a deal with O'Connell to take her to the lost city of Hamanoptra, since he was the only one who knew how to find it. After an action-packed trek to the City of the Dead, they explore its artifacts while a separate American expedition plunders nearby. But Evie reads aloud from an ancient text and inadvertently awakens a 3,000-year-old old vengeful spirit, as meddlesome people often do in these kinds of stories. Imhotep's arrival threatens the return of the ten plagues of Egypt, but his main objective is to resurrect his deceased lover with a worthy sacrifice. So they have to stop him before he brings more death and chaos to the world. Rescue the damsel in distress, kill the bad guy, and save the world. So, in your heart of hearts, have you always wanted to be a swashbuckler? <laughs> uh, you caught me, I admit. <laughs> Who wasn't? I. I, I, the films that I watched as a kid were Robin Hood and uh, Star Wars and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. I mean, they were pictures that were adventurous and exciting and, and comic at the same time and stimulated its audience to sort of want to live vicariously through those characters that they saw. And our take on The Mummy is no exception to that at all. I love both the main characters. O'Connell is the classic snarky ruffian, slashing and shooting his way through hordes of the undead. I feel Brendan Fraser really brought so much life and charm to a character that may have otherwise been dismissed as a bargain bin indie. That happens a lot around here. Meanwhile, Evie is a scholar and not a total damsel in distress. I. I am proud of what I am. Her character was pretty affirming for me as a kid. She always seemed so confident and self-assured in her intellect, even while being the only woman in the vicinity. I am a librarian. Rachel Weiss is just so endearing, so lovable in this role. And the playful chemistry between Fraser and Weiss really carries a lot of the humor and charisma of the film. For a long time, I thought, like many probably do, that this is Fraser's movie and he's the main main character. But rewatching it now, they actually seem much more balanced in their roles. One doesn't seem more important than the other, and they repeatedly save each other instead of it being one-sided. Neither are their sidekick or just the romantic interest. They're partners. A critic at the time said, Evelyn and Rick are basically Indiana Jones split down the middle. She's the brains, he's the brawn. Though I will admit the romance aspect is framed poorly at the beginning. It's not a complete disaster, it's just dated. Like most of the CGI. Like, I don't know who'd be thoroughly smitten by an unsolicited kiss from some guy they just met. But if you take that aspect out, the rest of it is mostly cute. There's a reason people still write fanfiction about them to this day. Also, yes, they are both hot. Either way, their dynamic mirrors a character format I've noticed in a lot of these movies. The Reluctant Companion. It's somewhat similar to the buddy cop formula, a pairing of two characters with dissimilar personalities who are forced to work together to reach a common goal. And there's often someone on this journey that doesn't want to be there at all or simply doesn't want the other person there, and it makes the whole ordeal that much more hilarious. We've seen countless examples of this in adventure films, from Moana and Maui, Will and Jack, to Shrek and Donkey. No! You dense, irritating miniature beast of burden! Yes, I count the first part 
part of Shrek as an adventure movie, and I refuse to believe otherwise. This character dynamic is reused so often because it works so beautifully, both for humorous effect and for potential character development. We see them bicker and get on each other's nerves, until they eventually form a begrudging yet unbreakable bond through their shared experience. It's a time-honored storytelling staple that highlights some of the best aspects of adventure films, and budding friendship stories in general. But it doesn't always work. Last year's Jungle Cruise tried to do the whole movie based on a theme park ride like the Pirates franchise, complete with villains mutated by their surrounding elements. But it also gets compared a lot to The Mummy. A Rotten Tomatoes reviewer pointed out its familiar summary. An intelligent and troublesome young woman is underestimated by academic elites. She then, along with her eccentric brother who serves as comedic relief, seeks the help of a handsome leading man who is frustratingly arrogant yet the key to finding the object of her fascination, unleashing an ancient monster who was once human along the way. I present to you the plot of both The Mummy and 2021's Jungle Cruise. It attempted the same sort of pairing with its characters, but something about it just fell flat to me, though that may be due to the overall weaknesses of the film bringing it down. Jungle Cruise isn't a bad movie, it's just passable, kind of like it was spat from a Disney conveyor belt. Frank, get it! Hold on. Come on! I got it! Frank. I don't got it. No, 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 no. And even though Emily Blunt and The Rock are great, I don't think they managed to save this movie from its blandness. On the other hand, the back and forth between Evie and O'Connell adds a memorable layer to the comedic relief that often feels necessary for something like this to work. This inherently cheesy premise necessitates a certain layer of silliness. Which is why I feel the 2017 reboot didn't pan out. This movie isn't the dumpster fire a lot of people make it out to be. It's fine, but ultimately forgettable. Unlike the 1999 version or even its two sequels, the most recent Mummy film seemed to take itself a little too seriously, and even did the whole thing where teal and orange was the only acceptable color scheme. In 1999, they knew what kind of film they were making, and were self-aware enough to be generally lighthearted in its execution. Not to mention there's a friendly demeanor about Brendan Fraser that just made him supremely goofy and likable. Mummies. Tom Cruise, even though he can be charismatic, is just not that guy. Ironically, Fraser's role was originally offered to Cruise when they were casting back then, and I'm low-key glad he turned it down. But anyway, with this new version, it seems they got so caught up in trying to set up a new dark cinematic universe that they neglected to consider its quality as a standalone work, and also disregarded what made the franchise so appealing in the first place, which was a playful sense of adventure. Obviously, 1999's Mummy was cheesy, but that's part of what made it so fun to watch. They tried so hard to make it all into a Tom Cruise action movie instead, and I don't think a grittier reimagining like they've managed to do with Batman could have worked as well for The Mummy. The material just does not have the bones for it in my opinion. On that note, I want to get into the plot structures that really make an adventure film. When I think of a bare-bones structure for a quote-unquote adventure narrative, I found that it usually involves a combination of three storylines from the seven basic plots theory. I don't know if I necessarily agree with the theory that all stories can be boiled down to one of these seven plots, but that's not the point here. It's definitely an oversimplification, but it's just a basis for the fundamentals of storytelling. And for me, good adventure stories typically draw from these three to some degree, though the levels vary. First, the quest. You have to get to an important place and or acquire an important object. In the case of the mummy, Evie made a deal with O'Connell to take her to the lost city of Hamunaptra, because the British loved stealing artifacts. I'm kidding. I mean, it's true, but not entirely in Evie's case. The character's half Egyptian and works at a museum in Egypt and had always been fascinated by the Book of Amun-Ra, so she hoped to find it there and learn more about ancient Egyptian civilization. The quest storyline is mostly used in the first half of the film before they accidentally unleash the mummy's curse. But the appeal of the quest is there's a simple, clear-cut goal. I love narratively complicated films as much as the next person, but sometimes your brain just needs to go on a straightforward journey. And the quest is perfect for this. Give me a location, maybe throw in a MacGuffin like the Book of Amun-Ra for even more tangibility, your hero has to find the Ark of the Covenant before the Nazis do, or restore the Heart of Tefiti, or cast the One Ring into the fires of Mordor. What are you waiting for? Don't get me wrong, a bunch of other stuff might be going on along the way in your binge watch of the Lord of the Rings Extended Edition, but mainly we just need our boy Frodo to get to Mount Doom and destroy the ring. That's what all of this has been about. Evie's quest isn't even a good idea for her to carry out, but without it there's no movie so we gotta keep it moving. Next in the plot types, there's the voyage and return, where our heroes venture to an unfamiliar place and deal with whatever it is they have to confront along the way, whether that's defeating threats or learning necessary lessons before returning 
coming home. They just don't make quicksand like they used to. Quest and Voyage sound pretty similar and there's often overlap, but it seems a key difference is whether the main character intended to take this trek or whether they're thrust into it out of the blue. So like a reluctant Bilbo versus a determined Frodo. I will take the ring to Mordor. The mummy interestingly does both. They willingly travel to the lost city of Hamunaptra the first time, where Evie screws up and dooms them all, and when she's captured they're forced to return. But the voyage doesn't have to be a grand journey traversing across distant lands like Homer's Odyssey. I think the voyage plot can involve characters somehow experiencing a simpler time right in their backyard, so to speak so that we get a more classic, low-tech adventure with modern characters we can relate to. The Goonies were like down the street from their suburban homes, wandering through tunnels to find pirate's treasure. In the newer Jumanji movies, they're transported into a video game and have to make their way through the jungle to escape. As viewers, we're also experiencing an unfamiliar place or time, which is like the lifeblood of adventure stories. The enticing element of discovery, of the unknown. Partially filmed in the Sahara, The Mummy takes place in the 1920s when interest in excavations of Egyptian tombs was growing. And naturally, it revolves around ancient Egyptian mythology, which has been a major point of Western fascination since the 19th century when Napoleon invaded Egypt. This cultural fixation even has a name, Egyptomania. Of course, almost every everything about Egyptian culture and mythology in The Mummy was wrong. Some films are getting better about this, but I don't think we should necessarily expect to learn anything of value from these blockbuster movies, or give them cinema sins dings for historical inaccuracy. As this New York Times article put it, largely self-nourishing, Egyptomania was often detached from its original sources, and the stream of dime novels and films about mummies and their curses have, according to scholars, more to do with Western guilt over imperialism than with the supernatural. These are popcorn flicks for the masses, there's not a lot going on under the surface here. I'm not going to take it too seriously and grade it by a standard they're not even aiming for. I don't know, I'm Caribbean and I don't watch Pirates of the Caribbean with any of those expectations. I just want to see cool sea monsters, you know? Now, that's of course different from the matter of casting and extras, which again is another of those pretty dated aspects of the film. The Egyptian characters aren't played by Egyptians and the movie is littered with stereotypes about Arabs. I mentioned this phenomenon when I discussed Creature from the Black Lagoon. But it so happens that when stories take place in a professed exotic land, even if the main antagonist is ancient, the local residents are often the first to die and are typically othered along with everything else, including the monster. Honestly, this has been a long-standing feature of adventure films that is hopefully evolving. Though to be fair, the typecasting in The Mummy extended to the American characters as well, as they were stereotypically rowdy, greedy, and trigger-happy, and were promptly killed by Imhotep due to their hubris. Speaking of, the third and final plot element I wanted to discuss is overcoming the monster, where our heroes plan to defeat some force of evil. Now, this aspect is probably why this was one of my favorite adventure films growing up. It may be that the best part of The Mummy was, well, The Mummy. <laughs> The film's technically a reboot itself. The original in 1932 gave us a version of Imhotep played by Boris Karloff of Frankenstein fame. It's a much slower, more subdued film, a stark contrast to the mummy we know today. And in 1999, they significantly revamped the movie monster himself. At that point, the concept of a mummy as a monster had long been dismissed as silly, a groaning guy wrapped in toilet paper slowly lumbering toward its victim. Here we go again. We've completely reinvented the character. Um, people, of course, when they think of the mummy, they think of something stumbling around wrapped in bandages and gauze, slowly pursuing some poor hapless guy in a pith helmet who might conveniently trip and fall, you know, so that the mummy creature can all get him and sort of choke him slowly to death. But you just want to shout, run faster! But that's not what happens in our take on it. 1999's version of its titular antagonist managed to reignite the long-lost sphere of mummies. Right off, I said, it, nobody wants to see a guy wrapped in bandages. We have to do computer-generated mummies and make it really as realistic and believable as possible. Imhotep has to be straight. He has to be scary. I don't know about you, but this guy terrified me as a kid, although the CGI is admittedly subpar. Though at least it's not as bad as the PS3-like effects in The Mummy Returns, which I can't watch without laughing. Still, Imhotep is a genuinely unnerving and formidable foe, and the film opens with his story. He was a high priest in ancient Thebes having an affair with the pharaoh's mistress. When they were discovered and she ended up dead, he tried to resurrect her but was captured 
captured and mummified alive by the pharaoh's guards, who placed an evil curse on him that granted its victim eternal suffering, but also inconveniently gave him unholy powers and control of the ten plagues if he were ever awakened. Which, naturally, he was. I forgot about this, but he doesn't even show up again after the intro until an hour in. And that's where things really got juicy. He's still... still... Juicy. Yeah. It seems like most popular adventure films have some element of horror attached, even if fleeting or just mildly scary. Not always, but often. Melting face Nazis, an enraged Tafiti crawling on all fours, immortal ghost pirates whose cursed skeletons are illuminated by the moon, or even the brutal and untamed sea itself. It's always been more compelling when there's a genuinely threatening or even creepy force the characters are forced to overcome. You want to inspire a sense of bone-chilling danger in these stories. A sense that the protagonist is somewhere they're not supposed to be. In that vein, something I noticed in my rewatch is that many of the mummy scenes are approached like genuine horror movies. When discussing movie monsters, the director said, Frankenstein made me sad. I always felt sorry for him. Dracula was kind of cool and sexy, but the mummy just plain scared me. So, making an adventure film that incorporated a classic movie monster gave it the chance to lean into the more spooky aspects of the adventure genre. So there are horror-like scenes like the one where a guy from the American crew loses his glasses, classic, and is ominously stalked by Imhotep in a passageway. Or when another dude's life force is ferociously vacuumed from his body, and it's only depicted through the use of shadows. There's also the ghoulish face regularly materializing in sand, a sight which even makes the movie poster look like it's for a horror film. Or Evie coming across the eye-plucked American, only to then encounter the awakened spirit of Imhotep for herself. Of course, many of these moments are met with humor to balance out the fright. I've talked about this before, but comedy and horror often go hand in hand and make for quite an effective pairing despite the tonal differences. To go along with this duality, not all the mummies could be quite as fearsome as Imhotep since they'd outshine the terror he inspires. So they still managed to give a nod to the bandaged mummies of the past with practical effects instead of CGI, for the most part. Then I thought, oh, we have all these priest mummies, that should really be a throwback, a wink to the 1932 Boris Karloff version. One of the things that we did have some fun with is the notion that they were a little bit more akin to, you know, where the mummy used to be, say the 1932 Universal Mummy, because they really are guys wrapped in bandages. Because, you know, one of the things that's so lovely about the mummy films is that there's a great interaction between, you know, comedy and horror and action. And for whatever reason, body horror in particular is a pretty recurring sight in these stories. The captives of the Flying Dutchman, deformed orcs, sloth from the Goonies, those melting face Nazis again, in case you missed it the first time. And The Mummy is no exception to this tendency for body horror. Not just with Imhotep and his half-decomposed body, but those damn beetles. The flesh-eating scarabs gave me nightmares about bugs crawling under my skin, and I spent at least a couple years afraid of the potential of this actually happening to me. In this scene, a beetle crawls out of Imhotep's neck and into his cheek and he eats it as a snack. Seriously, sometimes these beetles felt like the true antagonist of the film. So the horror provides a pronounced element of danger, a taste of peril that's not too much to discourage our hero's curious spirits. These kinds of stories are inherently imbued with panic and mystery, and experiencing this discomfort from the safety of your couch or theater seat is part of what keeps us coming back. Plus, at the end of the day, the good guys win. They find the lost treasure to save their neighborhood, they destroy the ring and defeat Sauron, the Nazis die horrifically, and Evie reads from the Book of Amun-Ra to make Imhotep mortal again, giving O'Connell the chance to kill him and send him to the underworld where he'll never emerge again. Or will he? Death is only the beginning. Sequels aside, I think The Mummy is a fantastic film that showcases just what draws us to stories like this. There are definitely dated cliches that should be improved upon in present day films like this, but all in all, it's one of the best examples of what makes the path of the adventurer so alluring. And I'm really looking forward to other attempts in the future.
And while we can't enjoy a tasty snack of flesh-eating scarabs, today's sponsor, HelloFresh, has plenty of better options. We wanted to try HelloFresh for so long because one thing they don't warn you about adulthood is the exorbitant effort required to just feed yourself every day. All the planning, the prepping, the shopping, all the time. It takes up so much time and energy. HelloFresh saves you from a lot of the hassle and just ships ingredients right to your door, pre-portioned so it cuts down on prep time and food waste. The instructions were so simple even we could follow along. Long. Also, the food is genuinely delicious, which is pretty key. Today we made their sweet chili pork and cabbage stir fry, and it was so good we were kind of shocked we made it ourselves. We got a meal for two, but you could just as easily increase your order size for bigger groups or for planned leftovers. And their meals are customizable now through their new Hello Custom offerings, so you can really tailor it to your taste, whether that's swapping out a protein or side, upgrading if you want to be more bougie, or adding protein to a veggie meal. All the options just make it easier to stick to any health goals you may have, including if you prefer vegetarian or pescatarian meals. If you want to try out meals from their variety of recipes, go to HelloFresh.com and use code QUALITYCULTURE16 for up to 16 free meals and 3 surprise gifts. All in all, we're so happy to be working with HelloFresh. The food tastes great, it was quick and easy to make, and the time saved on prep lets us do other things we'd rather be doing, like making videos for y'all. Hope you enjoyed watching. If you like our videos, consider supporting the channel for $2 on Patreon. These videos take a lot of effort and not all of them can be monetized, so any support is super appreciated. But with that, I'll see you guys next time. Bye.